So it's time for our second key keynote address to be held by Richard B. Freeman. So Richard holds the Herbert Ascherman Chair in Economics at Harvard University. He is also involved in different positions at many other institutions, such as the Harvard Law School, the London School of Economics, the NBER, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the U.S. National Academy of Science. He has won several important awards and is generally regarded as one of the world's leading labor economists, but he has also made important contributions to the fields of uh, the economics of science and engineering. Uh, he's been immensely productive. He has written at least 18 books, edited 23 others, and published over 300 articles. So please join me in welcoming Richard B. Freeman to the podium. Thank you. And some of that will, 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 will Franco gave through, gave, I, mean, I knew he would without ever conversing with him, gave some of the facts that I'll just quickly just go through. Then I, I want to talk about uh, uh, the fears. Why is this, is this inequality seen as a, a specter that's haunting us? When if you go back uh, 40 years ago, you would have said, gee, we it's not every country, but many countries would have said, we need more inequality because it will give us more uh, incentives for efforts and so on. So it's been a tremendous change. I'm going to offer two very peculiar, uh, interesting models, and, uh, I, 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 and you'll see what they, what they are. Um, and then talk a little bit about uh, the futures of roadmaps. And, and some other recent things that have been, ha have been happening in this. Well, the facts, this is Branko's talk at the beginning, uh, uh, the inequality rising in, 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 uh, in, within countries. I, I just would emphasize part of that is that the informal and irregular work persists in most countries. So that, that has a certain labor market dimension, and that capital share of income has risen. Uh, in China, is among among other places, in pretty much most of the countries, uh, and, and then across the countries, um, conditional on the PPPs or influ influenced by the PPPs or something, uh, we have seen the uh, in in income inequality falls among people, and, and he said that. I also would just add one one additional uh, thing that I think is quite important is we're seeing spread of higher education. Uh, to all the major developing countries in a huge way. And that also is a, is a movement towards e equality of, of people. China, of course, is graduating, graduated what, last year, six million uh, uh, bachelor's graduates of varying quality. But uh, China graduates inside China, not in people uh, getting educated in the West, inside China more PhDs than any other country. The U.S. has been the leader in, in that. Again, very quality. That India has had a huge increase in university education, but we tend to ignore it because it's dwarfed by what China did. And if you eliminated China, the Indian thing would be one of the miracles of growing higher education as well. And Brazil has is, 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 is been very good too. So, so th th this reduction of, of inequality worldwide occurs not just in the income statistics, GDP things, uh, but, but also in, in, in education. Um, I just want to make a comment as to where much of this wealth uh, 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 or in, in inequality comes. So you will remember the protests in the US, which certainly in our country sort of focused people, oh my goodness. <laughs> It was the uh, upper 1%, right over there, and then it's the self-proclaimed 99%. Uh, um, the, the, I, I, get, I actually get contacts from the Occupy Wall Street people. They, the, the, that group was very well educated. Many of them made good money on Wall Street. And then they go into protest things, and they're all having, as far as I can, this one's contacted me, having pretty good careers as it is uh, moving 
they're, they're not really part of the 99% and some deep sets. But I just want to point out, if you take the American income distribution, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the upper 0.1%. Let's just give the little figures here. That's huge. Just you know, fourfold, literally fourfold increase over uh, 40 years. Then you look within the upper one, upper 0.01%. And then you look at the upper 0.001%. And I've got some figures here. There's a, 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 some sort of a, a TV show. See how the top 0.001% live. And they, they, they didn't have a number that seems erroneous, but who knows? They claim there were over 1,000 American billionaires. Uh, the, the figures that, that Forbes publishes gives us less, uh, but no one's quite sure how Forbes, you know, how do you know the hidden wealth, which is what Franco referred to, or, uh, and, 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 and how they're valuing different things. So I just give some, these are now published from the US Internal Revenue Service, the top 400 US taxpayers, uh, they get 1.59 percent, 10 percent of capital gains. So we know that these people are really heavy into ownership. That's how you you get to be this billionaire. And then, I, so that's just published figures you can you can get from our, our uh, the IRS puts that out. So there is so that when we think about the inequality, it's it's really been concentrated extremely small number of people. I mean, the upper 10 percent is better than, but not than you know the other people, and so on. But within every group, you see it, it becomes more and more. So this is the uh, count of billionaires. Um, the lower count. This is 2014, as of the spring. Uh, the U.S. had 492, which puts us number one. Uh, we had eight of the top 10, so we're feeling really good about our performance in this uh, contest. Um, and the, 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 Net, net worth. Number two was China. Um, that's pretty striking. And I, the, the, any of the income inequality Gini coefficients that the Chinese officially have are inconsistent <laughs> with this level of, uh, of, 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 of billionaire status. Russia. The EU would be second if you were one uh, country. And that again connects to what Frank in, the, in, the, in this morning uh, laid out about how, 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 how the, 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 as more, people, more countries join the EU, you see this. And then I just said, Sweden? How many are there in Sweden? And that was 19. I was somewhat surprised that number of billionaires given the, you know, Sweden with the tax rates uh, that have declined and, and so on. And um, include the number 12th. You, you might know who he is. If you're, I, I, I've forgotten his name, uh, but it, it wasn't he. Uh, and so there are people who cheer for that. On this machine that at hand is not moving, it's supposed to move and go clap, 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 clap. Uh, um, it's, not, it's not clapping right now. Um, OK, so, we, so we've got this, 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 this massive uh, shift of, of income distribution that they, they say, well, should, should we worry? Should we not? We're not worried. I, I'm going to be very brief too about the, the, the reasons because I want to go to cures in, 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 in a, in ultimately. That, that's what I'm like. Well, the skill bias, technical change, dot dot. Um, and nowadays there is much greater, I think, evidence coming forth that has forced people who downplay trade as a factor to now say that's part of it. And you know, and then there, some people will say it's a mixture of the two. And it's hard to pin down, but I don't think you would want to deny the trade at this at this point. If you would, you know, there'll be a whole bunch of people who would jump all over you with with, with, with statistics uh, about that. There's been somewhat less discussion of, of the capital share rising, and is that consistent? But if capital is more or less complementary with skilled labor, you can see you you might tell somewhat similar stories about technical change and so on. I was, was great, great, greatly impacted, or thought, my, my thinking was, when China and India came in and the Soviet Union collapsed, that basically this doubled the size of the workforce available to modern capitalism. And uh, they brought in almost no capital. 
uh, um, some of the, 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 the Russia being the most advanced of the places, some of the of, of their production things had negative value added, uh, and and they were specialized in producing weapons. Uh, kinds of, uh, that may have had some value to, to somebody, um, etc. But, but, but so we did have a, a huge glo you know, global effect from the opening of, 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 of the world. It means spread of knowledge, etc. Uh, Piccany Space put a great stress on the, uh, the rate of return of capital being, being high. And that really brings the capital component into it, but mostly a labor market the story. And then I just put down below this because some people could just say these factors are maybe the uh, intermediate routes. But we do know there's been a great weakening of trade unions and a whole lot of other institutions in, in, in countries. Um, and then there is what I'm going to put a big stress on is the danger. And I think this ultimately will, will, will be one of the, well, why this is, you see this as a specter, is that the rich will dominate the government and they're just going to lock in. It's everything against the equality of opportunity. Uh, but through, but my argument is through, is through capital ownership side, uh, less than through, through labor market kinds of things. So that's, that's why I think. And just as a, as, a, as a fact from the U.S., um, the basic way our executives get huge amounts of pay, you know, you read things, they're paid 500 times the average worker, blah, blah, blah. It's not through their salary. It, it comes through capital, let me phrase it correctly, linking their income to capital. And so the, the, the green uh, line here is options, the amount they get through options. What you see at the bottom, the, the blue, uh, is the salary. The salary has not gone up all that much. And there's a reason for that, is a, is a tax reason, that a company that pays a salary be, beyond uh, a million dollars has to take that money beyond a million and it, gets, it, it, it pays a profits tax on that. So it is not fully treated as a cost. So of course, intelligent companies will then say, I'm not going to go beyond and pay that extra, extra amount. Uh, so what I do is I pay you in all different other ways that are viewed as, as incentive pay. And incentive pay was specifically uh, uh, treated as a separate category. So what you see is the, you'll still come to any number of American executives that were paid a million dollars. And then, uh, and then everything above that, uh, which may just be what they would have made, you know, they didn't have this tax uh, key. Maybe they'd be paid, you know, four million dollars in, 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 in cash. But it is tying it to capital income. And you could argue whether it should be counted as capital ownership, uh, which indeed what I think presumably the shareholders want them to have an ownership stake, so they're lying the interest. Uh, or is it, it just it's just a, a way around the tax around, around the taxes? That's all. Now, now I want to get to the fears because the, the, those sort of basic facts, uh, you know, seem a little bit from uh, American perspective. But but Frank got the bulk of everything that down in the, in the first talk. The U.S. I'm going to explain this has had a historic fear. From, from the founding of the US, US, United States of inequality. And it's sort of strange that we are seen as the, you know, we are the most unequal of the advanced countries. And they were seen so favorable to it. The Chinese, well, these are the two big, two of the big giants in his uh, little thing of reward development. I just don't know enough about India to say anything uh, uh, there. Uh, it, it's all about threat to social stability. And so that's what they're afraid of. And they have, the leaders of China have said this distinctly. Um, and the Americans, our leaders have not spoken in the, in the same clarity about what the fear is, but I'm not going to show you. <coughs> There's a, a lot of discussion and some evidence, and I, I picked one here which just, I thought was insane. Uh, this is that ultimately inequality is going to feed back on the well-being of the majority. And the thing all people often focus on is on health. And so there was this article in The Guardian on July 7th, look it up, 
because I sent it off to a science friend of mine who works on centenarians. I mean, they're studying people or creatures that live way beyond, out on the tail of the lifespan to see what it is about them that can make humans live longer. And, and, and so when I sent this to this, this former student of mine, and I said, I guess you're just doing an evil job <laughs> because the Guardian says you're going to produce a race of long-lived billionaires who will squeeze everybody in every possible way. Uh, he, he said, I've got to work in my lab. Because <laughs> we think of this as really benefiting all of us if, if they, they discover stuff. There's also, I think, a fear of loss of collective ability to respond to global challenges. That is, we get more and more divided up. It's just harder to have a, a, a uniform response. And you see that in, in the US, in the vengeance of uh, conservative people with a lot of money or, or do not believe or claim they do not believe in climate change. It's all a plot by a bunch of evil scientists being paid by government money, etc. cetera. And, and that's a serious you know, thing in the, in, in the, in the US. So, uh, the, 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 and, and yes, yeah, so we, they, we they no longer respond. One of the political parties, the Republicans, who have traditionally been pro science, pro, been, been a, a businessman, you know, business people tend to be rational. They have no longer fully rational, I would say, in, 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 in their responses to this. And then what, what troubles me, uh, I call the opportunity cost of failure. There's so much science going on. There's so much improvements in technology. There's so many things that uh, people in universities are doing, people in companies are doing, to fail to you know, bring those things out at this moment of history is just awful if we're going to end up in uh, the distributional disasters or, or whatever it is. So those are fears. Now I want to give you the, 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 the way this fits into the American uh, uh, picture, and then I bring some Europeans in too. This is a famous statement by Justice Brandeis. We may have democracy, or we may, may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. He was a very famous Supreme Court. And then I, I put a niece of economists who want to see the model. This is a multiple equilibrium model. You can have either this equilibrium, democracy, or you have this equilibrium, which is extreme wealth. And then I said, well, see, the Europeans must have something to say about this, and the best statement is by Machiavelli. There was a thing where he says, who has the gold, that means who controls uh, uh, the money, gets to rule, controls the government, and then he who rules gets the gold. And I note that this statement is a dynamics for the model, because that's a differential equation, and you and you can you know you can solve the, the, the differential equation. So the, these I, I wanted to transform these historic statements into things that we would treat as models. And so I called this the Brandeis uh, uh, Machiavelli, the BM model. Uh, they didn't write it out this way, and, and I am not giving you the math uh, for it. And you can all do it uh, you know, in your heads. And then I want to then add another aspect to this. I call this Madison Adams theory. This is, the, again, the founders of the US and the, 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 the fear. J James Madison, who's, who's here from Virginia, was perhaps the smartest guy we had in terms of thinking like a social scientist. Really extraordinary. Uh, uh, and you read him and you just go away and go like, Gee, he really, really is. So, so I put in bold what his view of what's going to happen if we have a lot of inequality. And he says, in either case, liberty will be subverted. And liberty made its appearance here in the last talk, talk as, a, as part of a, 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 the three things that, that were granted. You can't have all three. And the American view is you can't have mass inequality historically. Is, and, and, and have a lot of inequality and have democracy. So the first, he says, it, it, it's possible that it will be a despotism uh, growing out of anarchy. And I think of that as well, French Revolution kind of stuff or, or whatever. You know, people with the poor people are rioting all over the place. Maybe this is the kind of thing 
we have in the, in the in the perhaps in the in the Arab states at the, the you know at the, at the at the moment. You have, you have just a, just complete. And then the one that I think is more relevant to the advanced countries now is an oligarchy founded on corruption. Um, and the corruption in the U.S. is what's the correct word? The corruption right now, China, as you may know, is on a big campaign against corruption. We're not quite sure exactly what that means. In the U.S., we have some, some court decisions that says corruption of certain kind is totally legal, and, uh, you know, et cetera. You can do, you can do things. To the right side is, is John Adams, second president of the United States. And again, the bold in the bottom is, the, is, 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 is he says, in that case, that's, that's with a balance he talks about real estate because the main capital form in the U.S. was land. The U.S. was a country of, 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 of uh, farmers. And he says, in that case, the multitude will take care of the liberty, virtue, and interest of the multitude in all acts of government. That's the view that if you have a middle class society, not too much in, 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 in wide income, the government will he didn't say median voter or something like that, but you could have you could have phrased it that way. It'll, it'll take care of us, and that kind of society is stable. So you, here you, you 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 see you have the two views: the fears of of of, of, of Madison, um, and and then he say, well, no, we, he's not predicting one of the two uh, results from mass inequality, uh, but he's saying one of the, here's two possibilities. And here you have Adams on the other side saying, we just keep our, our thing, the government will be a, a, a force positive. So I called that uh, Madison-Adams uh, theory, and then I stuck them together and I have BMMA model, which is meant to just focus as our, our minds as, as economists. That these statements were not, uh, what's, the, what's the right word, political nonsense. These guys were really thinking quite seriously. Then I almost added another one, but I decided not to, to, to do it the MMAE. <laughs> Dwight Eisenhower, uh, in, in 1961, gave a, a, a speech that shocked the Americans at the time. Um, and he was, of course, the great general who, 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 who you know, played the major, all, all the soldiers played the bigger role, of course, but, but he led the soldiers in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the World War II. And then it's all about, I, I just made one change in this. His famous speech was every, everywhere that he had military industrial complex that he was worried about. As in, this is when he was leaving the presidency, which meant he felt pressure as president all over the place for at that point build up more military weapons, you know, blah, blah. And, the, the, and then the companies who benefited from it, of course, uh, that's their business, they push for it. So I just replaced it to Wall Street and the super wealthy. <laughs> that's, that's basically my innovation. You can go back and see exactly what he said, but it, it, it just reflects, I said, updated to today. It's world. And then he's concerned about the public discourse being controlled by an ideological communication media. And you see that part of it, that's, I think, going on. Funding of research by foundations. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then he says, public policy could itself become the captive. I get put in wealthy elite as opposed to military industrial complex. That's, but you, you go back and you'll see it. it. I captured the correct flavor of his talk. And I am sure this was his last address as president of the United States when he, he was leaving office. So he was warning the country, I think. And I, I think it would it fit very well today, modified as I modified. The China fears, just briefly, the, 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 those, this was from the, oh, maybe four or five months ago, I haven't updated in the, the, the chart of the, or the, excuse me, the map. Those are numbers of strikes in different cities, and they have to be extremely underestimated because they basically, the people are either going through the newspapers, the local newspapers in China, they'll report, oh, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a strike here, there's a strike there. They tend to be very short, but they're all over China. And, and, and the workers just have, learned, have found that they can win things, that they cannot win 
otherwise, they just drop a spike in a short period. Those are not led by the Chinese trade unions, which are a government agency, but the Chinese trade unions have slowly been moving in some provinces at least to be at least supportive of the workers. They try to mediate, get them their, 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 their things. And then uh, there's, there's two strikes that, that I, that the, uh, the top one is, the, is the, it's got world attention in May 2010, it was the Honda strike. And I had students from, from uh, uh, Sun Yat-sen University send me pictures of the scribe, I have a whole collection of pictures of the scribe, because <coughs> fascinating. And the students sent this to me. I was, uh, uh, oh, that's <coughs> good. I mean, that's very nice. The second one is one of the strangest strikes, I, 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 and it's going to touch into to, to what we'll get to at the end here. That's a strike of employees of IBM in China who are protesting the sale. IBM just sold one of its large uh, uh, server, they, it, it, server manufacturing things. They sold it to Lenovo, which they previously sold to their PC. And Len Lenovo seems to be a pretty good company, as far as I can tell. So uh, it's, it's not that these workers are suddenly losing an IBM job. What were they protesting for? They were protesting. They wanted a share of the capital gains, <laughs> they didn't quite phrase it that way, but they wanted a part of the, of the sale price. They said, it's our company. We've worked for, the, for, for this. IBM is selling it. IBM is selling it, I don't know, two billion, three billion, whatever amount of money. We want some of that. And they went out on strike. And then, and then the, the thing that most blew my mind was, one of my Chinese friends says, look here, it said this, this sign or whatever it was they were carrying, says, that's what American workers get when, they, when you sell a company. Well, of course, American workers get zero <laughs> when you sell a company, to merge two companies. I don't get it if you're a worker, you don't get any problem. Yep. And, and, and I said, well, that's an interesting belief that they have about the way capitalism operates, that they actually own part of the company because they worked there for many, however many years they were working there. They did, by the way, get substantial severance pay that they otherwise would not have gotten by doing the strike, uh, 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 etc. So that's, and so you can see this, the Chinese government has, has a legitimate uh, sort of, uh, the fears are not ma made up. They, 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 they should be nervous that, that people are willing to go out and strike all throughout uh, uh, China and over, sometimes over things that come a little. Uh, so here's the Chinese government response. First, I quoted Jiang Zemin in 1998 when he, he sort of first put his finger on this, and he didn't say exactly the uh, certain social and economic problems. And by that, he meant inequality and corruption. They passed some laws designed to strengthen the hands of workers to try to, stay, to create more stability, contract labor law, which guarantees contracts to everybody, including the migrant laborers. They now have a law that every, every workplace is supposed to have a union with a collective bargaining, supposed to have a signed contract. So probably the official Chinese union rate and collective bargaining rate will surpass Sweden's. Uh, but most of these will be bogus sort of you know, unions that are government agencies. And now they've been on this, this rush to uh, 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 corruption. And you see uh, Chinese officials rush to sell luxury homes. What they did not report in, the, in this uh, newspaper, this was just a few days ago, uh, is that a lot of them are buying homes in New York, and uh, they're beginning to buy them in Boston. So you see those rent prices are going going up, going up in a, in a large amount because they want to you know, preserve in case they're going to be called corrupt. We want to get out of the country fast and have enough money overseas that you can live a good a good a good, a, a good life. So. This is, is, is your problem. Well, one of my friends, Mr. Murdoch, said this model is ridiculous. He's never asked the prime minister for anything. And I don't know, that's what he, he says. He, he, never, he never got any advantages from his political stuff. And then I had some other friends of mine. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, that's a, the, 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 the pudgy face 
was once a very nice undergraduate student who looked very nice. He went to Wall Street. That's him in 20 years after being on Wall Street. He doesn't look the same as he looked uh, when he was an undergraduate student. <laughs> and I went to the right, that's, uh, you, you, know, you know who he is. Uh, and what I quoted here was, was, was at the bottom is, it's, it's James Madison. It's just laying out this, the, 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 the model, this is a, uh, uh, this is a, 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 it's, it's a Chicago-ish kind of model. Because it just says, laws are made for the few, not for the many. And in, in, the, in the conservatives in the US, and we're libertarians certainly, but um, even our Tea Party stuff, the sense is that the rich control a certain control the government, so we want less government. Because if, if they, you know, they bailed out the banks with our, our taxpayers' monies, the bankers are back, nobody went to jail, nothing, nobody lost uh, you know, much of anything. They, and now they're paying giant fines, but it's not affecting their share prices very much. So it means that the fines must, et cetera, I don't know. But, I, but, but, but that's, that's response to Mr. Murdoch. So the end, I, I, I read this, this model uh, where the politics interacts with the inequality as giving us, and, and a whole lot of education, two possible serious equilibriums at this point. Well, one is a science fiction book that scared me when I was a kid because it was about two old people living in Wall, living in, at, at Wall Street in the, in the Empire, uh, not Wall Street, the Empire State Building they were living in. And they were, they were cadavers kept alive, like centenarians. <laughs> and they were controlling all the money in the world. And that's, the, if you read that story, you'll, you can actually download the book now free. Uh, on the internet because it's, you know, it's out of print for many years. Um, and then to the right is, is, is uh, something from uh, Jonathan Swift and H.G. Wells, which also is about, uh, 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 it's basically the exact opposite of all these equality of opportunity things. It's just the, the it's, except the, 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 the family, uh, you, have to, you have to treat the, the people living forever as sort of the family living forever, dominating the, the, way, the way we phrase it. And, there were some comments in there. To the right is what you go if you go to Silicon Valley. We're, 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 you, you, and it's also science fiction now. So Ray, Ray Kurzweil has written basically books that he claims are serious. And they are serious, but they're, they're more science fiction than they are a science fact. And he and has this, this term, this, this, people hear from this, the singularity, that we got, we got the computers improving so much and I would add, we also have the education expanding around the world, more people getting PhDs in science, engineering, knowledge, and, and the computer things, they just interact to produce potentially great um, you know, things to benefit all of, all of humanity. So there's the two, the two possibilities phrased in, a, uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in that way. And I've left off the, the James Madison's other possibility, which is more, I think, what's going on in the, I say maybe in the, in the Arab countries. And, and, but may, may, may strike parts of Europe, with, 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 we will see. Oh, that's right. And then there's a popular way of phrasing this, which, which uh, it's, it's, and, and this is gonna get to the, to the heart of what my, quote, solution, or, or the way to change it. It's who owns the robots rules the world. And that means who owns capital. Um, capital share is rising. The top people tie their income to capital income in the U.S. at least, um, and workers obviously can benefit if we own part of the capital that replaces us. So, if I was a robot here giving this talk, uh, um, and I don't know, you owned the robot, you would get every. You're not paying me anything, but <laughs> you get whatever rewards <laughs> come from, from doing that. If I own the robot, I, I gain the, 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 the award. So there, there's a very important thing about having the ownership of capital uh, be spread widely. And the robots captures it because you think of the robot replacing you. Okay. So what can we do? Uh, that's. Uh, uh, you can imagine a war of labor with capital, 
and strong unions bringing back I don't know, the golden ages of the 1950s or 60s. And I said, maybe in the Nordic countries, but not elsewhere. And I, I doubt that that's uh, you know, uh, going to happen. So I have to guide it with a uh, big uh, charger and another guy who's gonna, obviously going to lose. You could tax capital and, and try to redistribute stuff. And the, the, I mean, that was a Henry George favorite, you know, taxing land. Because land couldn't be moved. You should just tax land, and, and it's, it's inelastic. You get no loss of supply, uh, et cetera. Uh, today's capital is very mobile. Uh, I'm, I'm more dubious of, of, of uh, uh, Thomas Piketty's idea where somewhere we're going to establish a global uh, capital tax. Uh, but places that do well, though, do have a, 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 a special characteristic in Norway and Alaska two examples I know, two places that have not wasted their oil monies at all, and that's because they distribute it to, to people. And they hold it in funds, and then people, people benefit from it. But the biggest stock of all today, I think, is the knowledge capital, which is very hard to imagine. I suppose I could rent my brain out to somebody, or somebody could buy shares, and it's possible to imagine the, the, the shares and the, then you'd have great things in students and the, so we'd, we'd be able to get a, you know, you know, buy shares in the young students' future incomes and pay money now and so on and so forth. But I'm going to push for a more, I think it's more practical, or, or maybe not, who knows, but uh, this is to increase uh, our workers' ownership of capital and capital income. Um, and, uh, and, and the capital being a not the only contributor to inequality, but a major, major point. And that's what the U.S. founders saw. They saw a, a, a ownership as the solution. I put it in caps here. That was it. There was no discussion of trade unions at that point. We barely had any, you know, working uh, things or, or, or other stuff. And, 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 and so here's, here's again, again, John Adams, second president of the U.S., acquisition of land easy to every member of society. Jefferson, Tom Jefferson, cannot invent too many devices for subdividing property. Uh, Hamilton, who's considered you know, the more uh, Wall Street-ish kind of guy, same statement over there. And then Madison being always more careful and saying, without violating the rights of property, reduce extreme wealth toward mediocrity. So it's got to be done carefully and without uh, you know, breaking the, 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 the people's property is their property. But some fashion you have to do this. This is what they do. That's why Jefferson went on the, uh, to, to the Louisiana Purchase. It was very clear. It was to get more land to give to the Americans because otherwise we would be, inequality would grow. Because okay. The U.S. has uh, lots of what I call, it, here we call it inclusive capitalism. We got a lot of profit sharing, much more than Europeans. We gain sharing is profit sharing at a more lo local level, where it doesn't depend upon corporate profits or firm profits. It can be just if our group produces, you know, ex reduces costs in the public sector by a certain amount, we share in the in that reduction, and that and, that, and that's quite quite common. We, we were our, our 2014 survey is not yet out, so I can't give you. And then people own company stock, um, and people have options. And then I just talked a little bit about these, these systems. We have something called an employee stock ownership program in the, in the US. They, this is probably slightly outdated, the number of firms, um, and probably the, maybe another half a million workers. Uh, in our country, 40% more workers are part of an employee ownership scheme that are in trade unions in the private sector. That's pretty striking. Uh, 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 and I give the market value, dot, dot, dot. and uh, a lot of these closely held family businesses, which also raises some fascinating questions. Most of the evidence, I've been working with, with, with two of my, my colleagues, one economist, one sociologist, for multiple years now on how well do these companies do 
are they a viable form, or are they just this funny niche out here of, of, of capitalism? And so here I just summarize a whole bunch of studies, all of which say they have a, I'll say modestly, 2 to 3 percent higher productivity. Not productivity growth, but because the workers are involved, there is owners, and they, they, they'll, do, they'll do a little bit better. You can get CEOs of companies all over the place uh, who will, will swear to that, that their company that operates this way. Um, so I'll just give the evidence here. The, 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 the 2007 UK Treasury study was upset me because we were doing a study for the UK and, and along came this group, Oxero, some private uh, company that uh, was, was uh, we were given a contract from the Treasury and they had much better data than we did. And so our paper sort of came to a grinding hall. We said, oh, these guys got really confidential data of all these corporations from the Treasury. It has to be better. But they came, they came to essentially the same conclusion as other people had. So, so and then I, I got some more evidence. This is just referred to studies we have done. There are MBR studies. And, and um, one is these uh, worker reports. Most of the studies are very are done are based on company records of productivity things. We went and asked workers about how they, how they, what, what did they do when somebody shirks in their workplace? And we had the people who were paid with, with these more ownership kind of systems and the people who were not. And of course, the guys who were ownership say, hey, you better work. It's my money you're, 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 you're messing with. The other people, okay. and as a matter of fact, if you, your, your young faculty, uh, or a person tenure, and you're, you're competing for a tenure job, and the guy in the office next to you does very little work. Are you happy or sad? <laughs> well, you're probably happy because your chances of getting promoted went up. Uh, whereas if you, two of you were being judged as a team, you're, you're now going to say, hey, 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 you get, you know, get, get to work. So we've got that kind of thing. And then we have a, a study that took these great places that work, which are the best places in the country by, uh, this is a, a Fortune uh, magazine, the 100 places that people most want to, to work, work with. And it turned out an incredible fraction of them are employee-owned or have other forms of, uh, 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 of sharing. So that, that's, you know, that, oh, we get to this. The creme, uh, this is French, uh, but I, I think I should have put another sign there. But creme de la creme of worker ownership is British. Anybody who lived in London, you know John Lewis is the best uh, uh, retailer. They surpassed uh, Marks and Spencer in sales a few years ago. Um, and they set up the Waitrose uh, supermarket. And they have now become the, uh, they show the, the bottom figures are showing them, uh, et cetera. Uh, showing the earlier version. And Charlie, Char Charlie Mayfield is, 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 is somebody, I, I, when I was in the UK, I did speak with him. He just became head of the uh, 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 of John Lewis. And on July 4th, he didn't realize that was American Independence Day, I think. They declared uh, Employee Ownership Day. <laughs> and I saw this and I said, wow, uh, 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 that's kind of cool. And then he argues why businesses should be owned by their employees. And they really are an extraordinary company. Throughout the recession, they made enough profits that they were giving, uh, the, the workers were getting 2,000, 3,000 pounds a year bonuses in profit sharing. I mean, they, they really did, did extraordinary. Yeah, I've just been lucky, one company, but it, it's, it's they're good. Here are two American companies. Uh, uh, Wegmans, which does not have ownership but has profit sharing, and Cisco, which has uh, ownership in the sense of the workers don't own everything. But it's very rare they own. John Lewis, they own 100%. Uh, but in most places, they have a, s a substantial you know, ownership stake because it's part of the incentive, and, the, and, and no, there they are. Uh, um, Regman's is usually picked as the number one grocery store in the United States. Number one, and they are 12th in the, uh, this last year, in the uh, being best employer. Now, a grocery chain, that's pretty remarkable, because those are usually low level, uh, workers are usually 
not for real. You also have high school kids at checkout counters in the U.S. and so on. No, this is uh, it's uh, okay. So, so, so that's the, the, a case that yeah, there's a viable form of capitalism where workers have a more stake in of ownership. And now the question is, how do you get from here to there, which is our current where we sit now, to a place where workers are more involved in, 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 in this process. So I, I, it sounds like, um, you know, like, like, like your, your mother or your father saying, you know, be good, don't, don't, uh, don't drink too much, don't drink when you're in the car. So, but, but these are the points that I, I can, uh, there's a little more depth than just uh, whatever they are. No. No. It has to be gradual. It has to be consistent with national, if we're going to move over to this, national attitudes and traditions. The U.S. has such an attitude uh, towards worker, uh, work, workers being their own bosses and worker ownership that you can get the most right-wing, some of the most right-wing Tea Party guys lined up with left-wing Democrats to be in favor of more worker ownership. That doesn't mean they're willing to vote for certain bills. Uh, so, 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 uh, but, but it does mean you have a, a, a talking place where people, that's our country, that's not, not other countries. You have to be open to variety of experimentation. What works for Redmond's, which is uh, profit sharing, is not ownership. And if that's what the company and the fields and the workers are happy with that, you don't want to mess with that. Let them do it their way. Uh, it has to be supported by people, et cetera. And then the real, uh, Tough point, at least in the U.S., is these ESOPs have been given some tax breaks. Let's be honest. We're greasing the government is greasing the wheels for worker-owned enterprises. But and that's how they got to be 10 million or 11 billion uh, 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 things. And it's been stable because we haven't done much with the tax breaks in the last 20, 30 years. And so there's there is discussion. Of, how much extra tax break could you, should you, might you want to give if you wanted to expand this further? And then that there'll be the, the Wall Street lawyers and guys are going to find loopholes, uh, you know, in, in every possible way. Mrs. Thatcher tried, you know, the profit sharing scheme, uh, and, and the Brits have also tried a number of these things, less successful than the Americans for on, uh, reasons I don't fully understand, except for John Lewis, which is the best. The, the, uh, but the minute you put a profit sharing in, and I'm paying you some money, now the, the, the trick is I'm not gonna, and, I, I, and I've got some tax break on the profit sharing part. Ne ne next year you're not going to get a pay increase, and you'll get extra shares, whereas you would have gotten it in the thing. I'm just basically ripping off the treasury. So there's all kinds of stuff. We've had dis discussions with various characters. Larry Summers seems to be most concerned about this, and, and my answer to him usually is, I said, well. How much of the tax breaks that we give on R&D, which everybody loves that. How much, you don't think companies aren't shifting over resources to R&D to, 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 you know, so somebody who's working half time for the R&D director and half time for the either marketing director, he or she will suddenly be all on the R&D budget. Nobody's going to say anything. You, you, you have to have that, but you obviously want to minimize it. So I, I have a set of reforms for the U.S that are, I think, fit, and then, and then I'll talk a little bit about Sweden. Interesting. And, uh, uh, again, I'm very really good. Uh, we propose, and it may go into the next uh, Democratic Party platform, uh, but who knows, could go into the Republican platform also. Unfortunately, they, 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 they're so at odds with each other, if one of them put it in, the other one would probably denounce it as, some evil plot, and so you have a very strange uh, 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 situation. So what was to give them preferred treatment in government procurement programs? If you think that democracy will do better in the future with workers having a greater stake and less inequality, okay, you, you, you have a, IBM comes in with a, with a thing for you. We currently have special advantages for small companies. You just say, okay, if it's a worker-owned company or has profit sharing or whatever it is that the company's doing, that you, you, you make clear, you give them a little, a little edge. We give little edges to minority-headed companies. It's to add something to this. Uh, 
just to have a, put some money down for state centers. We have some, some states are doing things. It would be nice to get a lot more states involved in spreading information and so on. It's a big country and, uh, and there are lots of places. Uh, I'll leave I'll leave, I'll leave it out, but it's got to be brought in, but I'm not going to talk about it. There's things to change the performance of the government's pension funds. Because pension funds money basically goes to Wall Street and Wall Street guys run it. And um, that's happening because nowadays the pension funds realize that their manager of their pension things, who claims to be able to beat Wall Street, that nobody really beats the market. And it's better to have a, you know, an index fund of everything and that gets them out. But then the question is, do you use that money to push corporations to particular policies that, that you, you're now the owner. You have a right to do that. And then the tax uh, incentives, spreading those, some discussion. And there's a particular part of the uh, Internal Revenue Code that we would like to see change. We think it have a, a, a big effect. All very US uh, uh, special you know, kind of things that fit with the Americans. So none of this would fit for Britain. Brit Britain's copied some of the stuff from us. But we, we have never copied the John Lewis thing from the Brits, which is interesting, which is very successful. The Brits haven't copied the John Lewis either, particularly, so this, it, it, that raises an interesting question. Now, for your, 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 your Sweden went down this route with the wage earner funds, or something like this route. As so I did a bit of review of this, uh, 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 and talked to my friends, I was in Norway this week, this weekend, talked to my friends in Norway about, what do you know about this, da, 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 da. So this was my year's fund, um, which accomplished, according to Jonas uh, Pontesen and, and uh, Su Suresh Kuravela, uh, many years ago, said, achieved nothing, <laughs> basically, and uh, was, was, was generally viewed as a failure by LO and by everybody else, it's not a success. Uh, what was it, and, and, and this is now the, the, the partially my reading, and partially with other people. It's, it's, it's basically anti-incentive. The, the, the profit sharing funds of the, of the company are meant to bring the worker and the, uh, uh, as a partial owner of the profit stream. This was a profit tax that goes into an outside fund. So uh, to me, there's no, no reason why I should work harder for my company to make more profits when some fraction of it is going into this outside union controlled fund. And so I said it was designed to break the link between workers and their firm's profits. And that was part of, of the wage solidarity program of LO and, and the Social Democrats. So it was, it was my reading of, of my their first, I've been reading some of his earlier things, at least the ones in English. And it looks like, yeah, this was meant to strengthen this leveling of the wages. Um, and it, it really goes against, I called it anti-incentive. So companies aren't going to want this. They didn't. It was presented as a highly politicized change rather than a gradual something that we're going to experiment with because we think inequality is a great danger. It was presented at a time when there was no specter of inequality. So the idea that you should spend a lot of resources to do this didn't seem that much uh, uh, push, including among many of the union people, etc. And then it had some very we a weird uh, a process to get the local workers in. They would sit on the boards and, and they could direct, let's say, the shares in their company. But they didn't own the shares. And I, I compared this to Drucker's thing with pension fund, fund uh, it's quite called the socialism was all the workers, we all have pension funds, we, we actually use them actively uh, uh, to do this. This was, you have a general fund, and it's taken from your company, and now the workers in the company can, can say how they're gonna vote the shares when they don't own the shares. It just, it just doesn't have the right flavor, just as an economic uh, institution. Then, a, week, a few days ago, I was sitting in the offices of Skanska and, the, and uh, learning about their green policies. And I just happened, this is co totally by chance. A guy gives me, he says, well, you've got to see our annual report. And I said, oh, you know, it's 
200 page thing. I just happened to leaf through it while he was on the telephone for a minute. The, uh, the, 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 my, uh, the business guy was seeing me, and I stopped at this page, 167. I said, Ooh, you have an employee ownership program. And it was first introduced in 2008, but just has been just changed. You tinker with these programs. And I uh, read about this. And I said, ooh, first the question I ask is, is everybody covered in the ownership, or is this only for the top executives? Well, nope, this covers three kinds of people. Employees, normal workers. Key employees, which would be technical specialists, you know, high-level people, but not managers, and then in executives who get the best deal. This is a, a, a stock purchase plan, which many companies have in, in, uh, in, in, in the advanced countries. And I've actually studied these plans, and I work with a, with a particular uh, uh, company in, London, in their London office, trying to find ways to get more workers to participate in the plans. Generally speaking, they, they, they operate where you put some of your worker money down, and, uh, and then they will match you uh, on these different kinds of rules. So if I buy two shares of Harvard University, Harvard University, maybe the rule says, gives me one share up to a certain amount. And you quickly do the, the calculations of those. They're good deals. And, you know, obviously, if the shares go to zero, you lost your, lost your money. So you're taking some risk, but they're, 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 they're geared up, so they're, very, they're generally good deals. And we found that hmm, a lot of companies, maybe 40% of workers get involved, and a lot of workers don't. And usually it's the lower income workers who don't have the cash to do it, etc. Well, the, the Skanska plan was voted not voted, excuse me, chosen by the Global Equity Organization is a group of, uh, it's a business group that is for expanding uh, ownership um, all around the, 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 in major companies. And they have a fairly big uh, presence in Europe, uh, and they gave Skans a, a best plan of effectiveness. I thought that was great, because that meant that I could tell you the plan is really good without going through the very the details that, that, you know, which, which you have to go through and, look, and I'm not having really studied it. But they also have a problem. It turns out a lot of the blue collar workers, I'll say blue collar, lower paid people, maybe it's lower paid clerks. I was very careful to ask, there are two ladies, and you walk into company headquarters, there are two ladies who stand there, they are really, they're sitting by a thing and they give you a badge and they do all the kind of stuff to tell you where, where, where to go. And I said, are they included in the plan? And the executive said to me, yes, they are. Yes. And I said, OK, that's great. But what I, we didn't know whether they actually took their, some money and got involved in the plan. They also give some free shares. I think this is why I got this lesson. If your group performance is high, you get some just shares. So if and I'm not sure how they would judge the, the, the group performance of those you know, ladies doing that, doing that process. But so that's probably why I got this best award, because it had a, a, a sense of, uh, it isn't just your money, it's just work hard, and we're going to give you some of these shares for free, up to a certain amount. But then I, I went back and I said, what is strange about this? Here in Sweden, where everybody's supposed to be, many people are in favor of more egalitarian stuff, and when you read the, some of the details, it was pretty clear the executives were getting a better ride on the plans. <laughs> So an average worker would get one share free, executives might get five shares for the same uh, thing. And I said, no, 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 shouldn't, shouldn't. Now here I just said the unions should bargain for a more progressive share ownership scheme. This is the kind of scheme, it seems to me, that is much better than the old wage earners stuff. And companies want this kind of stuff. And, and so tinkering with it to represent the workers' views and move it a little more, you know, and because all I said, these companies they want, uh, they, they feel because people will, they know turnover is lower if you commit to the to the to, to the plan. People will work harder, you know, two percent, whatever whatever the number is of the productivity gain, they are 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 are, are committed to it. So I said that would be a good thing for the LO to pick up on. Um, 
Now we have the, the coup de resistance of this. It's not it's French also. Um, we just have anybody here heard about the market basket dispute in the US? It's the biggest labor dispute we have had in, say, in my lifetime. I've never seen a dispute like this uh, before. The market basket is a family owned grocery. It's rated number six in terms of quality. So Wegmans, the one I told you about before, is number one always. They're, they're just extraordinary. They're, they're the John Lewis, but done with a different, done for, with, with, with the property. The business model of this particular grocery is profit sharing, big profit sharing plan. They pay pretty high wages. They're clearly not you know, giving you profit shares instead of wages. Uh, the workers do. And they, and they, and they are rated as, as, as literally the cheapest major grocery in the New England area. They, they, they're by one, I, I said by one industry group. They, 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 you know, there may be somebody else in some other rate, but they're clearly a low price place. And they locate low, low and middle income neighborhoods. They have 25,000 employees, $4 billion in re revenues. Oh, you, know, you go walk by the grocery store, and I don't, I don't actually shop in, in that grocery store. It's not in Brookline, it's a little more upper income area. And, and we, we have a different, different grocery, set of grocery stores. Oh, and they, they suddenly was an explosion six weeks ago of this, in, the, in, the, in, this, in this company. Um, they're non-union, and they, they made the most successful worker protest that you could imagine. So here's a little history of this, but I'll just read, read it quickly. It was owned by a Greek-American family uh, that had had some serious uh, family disputes, including some things that should have put some of the family members in jail. I mean, there, there's there, once there were two sides of the family each wanted to control this. There was they, there was one one part was setting up sort of. Other corporations where money was being funneled through, so it, 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 but the, the, and it ended up they, they had to stop that as they one ripped the other off, and the, and the court came in, and so the two of them had just about one half of the ownership. Arthur T is the hero in this uh, saga, <laughs> or, uh, um, and he was CEO of the company, and he's devoted to the workers, and they, they love him, as you'll see in a minute. Most beloved, has to be the most beloved wealthy CEO anywhere in the world. You just can't you, can't, you can't match this. And he had a tiny majority because one cousin, you know, he had 50.5. And then this one cousin suddenly decided to join the other side of the thing, which was the group that said, what the hell's going on here? Why don't we just declare huge dividends for the family? And the hell with this, this let's, so, so they, let, let, uh, a year ago in August, they basically raided the profit uh, pool and uh, when they had this shift and they got large, a quarter of a, a, quarter of a billion dollars suddenly distributed as dividends. The, all the owners are, are members of the family. It's, yeah, it's a totally family owned industry. This year they were, I mean, who knows, I don't know, the, 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 there'll be many books written on this. They suddenly fired Dr. T, having tolerated him. And his cousin is who is Arthur S. So the two Arthurs fighting all, all, all over this. What happened, first of all, senior manager says they're not reporting to the new CEO. They refuse. That the company's run really well and everybody's got the nut. Then the, the, the eight senior managers got fired. Uh, uh, right off the bat. At which point the entire company, no unions involved, mind you, went on, went on literally on strike. They, 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 they had to be smart in going on strike. They would show up for work, but the people who delivered food to the warehouses didn't deliver. And eventually, suppliers who also found the company a great company to deal with farmers refused to sell them stuff. And so you, this, 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 that's a picture of uh, about uh, a week ago of what they had for offering. Then the customers who liked the store and felt it was a really great store, and I'm sure I've never, I've never, I, I will go back to Boston. I will go out of my way to buy in front of something just to see what the experience is like. And then when you go to John Lewis in London, you just are amazed at how 
um, the, 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 the staff is A, knowledgeable, and B, is actually seems to want to help you. Uh, they're not, you know, people who are going to make some money and that's all the reason I'm here. Well, they have a share. So we had this giant thing. They, the, the, uh, the giant dispute, and nobody knew how it was going to end. The company didn't want to lay off full-time workers because then they, then they, so the whole company might just crash. They did lay off part-timers. Um, they threatened more firings. They held a job fair, which was widely publicized throughout New England, to have people to take the jobs of the recalcitrant workers. And almost nobody showed up. I mean, the whole community said, nope, <laughs> on this. Uh, so, et cetera. Our governor, who's supposed to be a liberal Democrat, he basically told the, the workers, go back to work and let the, cat, let the owners fight their battle. I Meaning you're not part of this because you don't have shares. And they did, because the only pressure that the, 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 the fired CEO had on his thing was that the workers were not going to work for the successors, the successor uh, 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 managers. And so three days ago, I don't know, three or four days ago, I'm confused. The headline was, he bought it. They agreed to sell him the store. That's a picture from Labor Day News in Boston of the workers listening to him give a TV announcement of, of, the, of the victory. I bought this. Book. And uh, the, the looks on their faces, we, we have seen, we've seen now over the last six weeks. It's absolutely clear that workers idolize this guy. They, they, they re the signs were always, bring back our CEO. I think every CEO in the world should want to have that uh, you know, sense of the workers. Yeah, bring back our CEO. We're not working without him because he's the guy who makes the company run and who does it in this, in this great way. Now, the scary part is he had to buy one, he borrowed $1.6 billion from some Wall Street uh, you know, firms. He's going to be in charge of a, comp of a company that has lots of debts to pay. Some of the profits are going to have to go to paying off the debts, and I don't know what his long-term plan is. But this was, and I, and the quote here was, was, was awesome, for given, given that I started off with the American Revolution guys. This was the biggest day since we defeated the Redcoats uh, in the Revolutionary War. A huge, huge thing. And you just Google market basket, and you will just see all over the uh, you know, story after story. You get the videos you'll see. It's, 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 so it's a, a giant uh, uh, event. And as what some, one person said, it's going to be taught in every single uh, MBA class. You know, not not to be taught in every, every MBA curriculum. I mean, it's, there'll be a case study, a case of, of this. And it, it may fail in the end because I say it's very dead. And he may not be able to run the company the way he did before as a family owned business, where the family said, his part of the family said, we got enough money, let's have the profit sharing and let's do this and take the water. Okay, so that's, so now there's a whole lot of discussion in the U.S. What are the lessons of this? I phrased it for reducing inequality. Some people are phrasing it as, what are the lessons for increasing worker power? Let me just say, I called up, and the dispute started six weeks ago, and I called up a person I know very well in the AFL-CIO, I said, could you please send some people to help this group, the, these, these workers and customers. And they said, no, we're too busy. I said, what do you mean you're too busy to help workers? They're not our members. They're all they do, so they're not union. And we got to work for the Democrats to win the next election. So our unions, I feel like, hopeless. <laughs> Just don't, don't even, even now, don't understand that they have to stretch a lot. So here's just a set of questions. Is it going to cause more uh, uh, employee activism elsewhere? And manager activism. Key thing being the managers view themselves as with the, with the workers. US labor law has this sharp division. If once you're a supervisor, you are legally not, cannot be part of the union. And you, 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 you can be fired immediately if you don't do what top management tells you. You have no, no legal rights in that sense. Um, that was, a, I, I think, 
you know, a very smart thing if you wanted to control the companies and the workers, because the supervisors often will be the natural leaders of the workers. Uh, uh, and here they, here they, without a union, they, 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 they did, and they were fired immediately by the, by the company. We have something called a B corporation, benefit corporations. It's corporations in their charter are said that they, uh, they, they can do things for social good, not necessarily for profits. Now, for them, we don't know how they're operating. It just started two years, two, three, no, maybe it's four years ago, 20, 2010, 2011. Um, and we'll see how they operate. And then I, I just think of these governments and international economic agencies. You have the IMF, Christine Lagarde, um, said that inequality is a terrible thing. She's been making all these statements until they found out whatever shenanigans she was doing with, uh, with, with, uh, with crummy capitalist kind of deals. Uh, the OECD has had these credible statements. They have no, as far as I can see, they have no policy to do anything. So I said, but they, they can start moving in this direction. Here, let's, let's, let's see them start, start, start thinking, what's the best way to do this? They're, they can bring in Skanska <laughs> to, to tell them how they do it or something, or John Lewis, et cetera. Um, and the conclusion is I want to put a big thing on this ownership. Because equity in English has two meanings. And, and, and in this group, equity has meant fairness. But equity is also ownership. And in English, it's the same, the, the, the word has this dual meaning. And so I think if we're going to defeat the specter, you know, that, that inequality going on here, we've got to find a way to combine the two meanings. It, it can't be war of capital against labor. It can't be the, the, the type of funds that the, the, the LO pushed a long time ago, which was, you know, had the flaws laid out. And so I did the natural thing. This is a book that was written by me and two colleagues, just laying out the American history and all of the evidence that these companies work where they are. Doesn't necessarily mean, obviously, they'll work to expand this ownership thing to other companies. That's the kind of open question. But you have to push and see whether, whether other companies can, can, can also. And uh, these are all the presidents and characters. So I asked them, uh, what did you guys think of this? And they said, oh yeah, go for it. Uh, because we've seen the BNNA model says if you don't do this, you are, you are going to lose your, 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 your democracy. You know, and and, and the, the, this cures part of the inequality problem. Uh, no, that, that's the, the, the other part of it. Okay, that's fine. I don't know, turn it off. I'll leave it, leave it up there. Leave it up there. Yeah. <laughs>